Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, so we are here to discuss what I think is one of the most compelling subjects of our age, uh, the sharing economy, or as it's titled here, end of ownership, life in the shared economy. Well, in the spirit of the sharing economy, I'm actually going to throw my very first question to the audience. I want everyone in the audience to raise their hands if they use Uber. OK, just so we get the lie of the land. OK, hands down, most people. And a quick follow-up question. Everyone in the audience to raise their hands if they are uh, true believers in the sharing economy. OK, about 50-50. All right, so uh, we have to discuss this subject, a terrific panel. Uh, we have on the right here, we have Andrew Byrne, who is the head of public policy for Uber in vast tracts of the planet, as far as I can work out, <laughs> Europe, <clears throat> Middle East, Africa, and Britain, soon to be out of Europe. <laughs> we have Mary Beth Christie here, who I should say, in full disclosure, is a former terrific colleague of mine, who's now sadly <laughs> left the FT. Uh, she was, until very uh, recently, the chief operating officer of Tech City UK, but I now gather that uh, it's no longer Tech City. No, it will be till April. It's oh, it will be till, it's still Tech City, but it's about to become, become even, even bigger. We have Richard Lawton here, who wears two caps. He's the chief executive of Easy car and the chair of the sharing economy uk and then on the left we have professor colin mayer from the side business school at oxford university who is also as it happens presiding over an incredibly important groundbreaking project on the future of the corporation which is rather valuable given what we're here to discuss I am the editor of the Weekend FT, and the Weekend FT spends an inordinate amount of time looking at the sharing economy. And there's just one little brief uh, kaleidoscopic insight into this. Just the other day, I was in Shanghai, and I was made acutely aware of what a great global issue and story, indeed, this is when I saw the astonishing effects of these new bike sharing apps in Shanghai, which is leading to, I mean, one, the transformation of the transport system in Shanghai, but also mountains of very colorful bikes. <laughs> anyway, well, here we go. Andrew, I am going to uh, start with you. And I want to uh, open, actually, with a quote um, uh, and have your design. response to it. So this was a, we, we ran a long piece recently about um, when you're called, when your boss is an algorithm. And I think it was a very good overview uh, of the issues. But at the end, there was what you might regard as quite a provocative quote uh, from a man called Guy Standing. Uh, and he said, algorithms provide fantastic opportunities for rapacious exploitation of people who are at the bottom of the labor market. What do you say to that? Uh, yeah, that is a very provocative quote. Uh, um, yeah, we're, we're relatively used to that. I think, um, I think what we'd say to that is that algorithms also provide a huge opportunity for the people at the bottom of the labour market to find work, get work, and to work in a new, unique way that gives them power over what they want to do rather than having a corporation, a more traditional corporation, um, that has power over their... Uh, power over when people set their schedules and things like that. Um, and ironically enough, um, on a very personal Uber level, the reason that people come to Uber work, mostly typical private hire drivers, is because they are they're set fares and they get work in a very fair way, unlike traditional private hire operating when, frankly, you had to know the brother of the dispatcher or turn up <laughs> with a present for the individual who, is, who decides who gets the airport trips and things like that. And so there is a, there is a, also there is, a, there is a positive side to algorithmic um, distribution of labour. Richard, the, 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 the very fact that there is a government body set up to assess all this and look into all this suggests that there are those um, concerns here about potential exploitation. Uh, clearly, I mean, I think there, those concerns have been, uh, have been voiced, um, but it's a very complex situation. So if you have a look at people who work in the gig economy, what's called the gig economy, three quarters of them do something else as well. For three quarters of them, it's, it's top up. Um, and we know that um, the sharing economy in general, the gig economy in particular, offers opportunities to people who otherwise wouldn't be involved um, in economic activity at all. And so to the extent that it's uh, encouraging inclusion, you know, I think we need to be very careful about um, condemning, uh, you know, condemning a sector or condemning particular practices and then stopping other people from, from participating uh, in a useful and meaningful way. Mary Beth? Um, yeah, I think one of the challenges that I've seen is 
we're still starting from the mindset, although I guess those of us at a, at a certain generation, uh, that you start with the owner and then everybody reports up to the owner. Whereas in, in the shared economy, the real one is about people not having that kind of owner and employee slash slave slash this is what you're <laughs> going to do. Um, but it's, it, there's more freedom than that. And, and our regulations haven't caught up with that, nor our practices. I mean, I was just reading the other day that I didn't realize this. You couldn't share your driveway until 2014, when Eric Pickles apparently made it OK, okay to share your driveway. <laughs> to do that. As yes. And that seems crazy. Do we want to share our driveway with Eric Pickles? Well, <laughs> Sorry. maybe not with Eric Pickles, but it's, it's great that finally you're allowed to share your driveway, but I'm sure well, a lot of people used to do it. And Airbnb, it was illegal in London to rent your house on Airbnb until just before the 2015 election. Yep. It was the day before that they, they changed the law to enable that to happen. So, you know, regulation does need to keep up. And, I, you know, I'm sure there'll be circumstances where we might want to tighten things up in due course, but I think you have to be mindful of the impact of doing those sorts of things. And if you push a lot of people out of the labor market, then you'll find you have lower participation in the UK, but that just means people are pushed into the hidden economy quite a lot of the time. If you look at the UK, 78% of, of working age population participate. In Italy, it's more like 63%. It's not that those people aren't doing anything necessarily in Italy, it's just that they're not inside the tax base. So it's, you know, I think it's useful to keep everyone participating within a structure that we understand rather than forcing them out. Colin, fairly something of a consensus here. How does it look to you as you sit in Oxford Business School looking at the broader issues? I think we're getting a consensus that the sharing economy can be a remarkable force for good or a remarkable force for ill as well. And the question is, how do we achieve the former and avoid the latter? Um, and one, one element that I want to emphasize is that we think a lot of the sharing economy in relation to tangible goods and services. The, the one that I think is particularly interesting is in relation to information mm. and the sharing of information, because information is the ultimate public good. It doesn't depreciate. Uh, you can supply it to others at zero marginal cost, and it creates cumulative increasing welfare for all of us. But so does disinformation. The only difference is disinformation creates cumulative negative social value for us. And that, I think, brings out a key element that underlies all of this conversation, and that's the role of trust. And really what underlies the uh, sharing economy is the fact that it's a two-sided trust relationship. The supplier of information has to trust the user not to turn it into misinformation as much as the user trusts the supplier of, of information. And, and the... The, the factor that's emerged over the last few years is the role of n not having direct communication with people on the other side, so that you're essentially connected in an electronic form, which is fantastic. And that's where all of the power comes from, the power to do a great deal of good and also the power to do uh, not, not, not such good. And the question is, how do we build up those trust relationships? Um, and, that, and, and that's compounded by the fact that because it's, these are all essentially public goods, then in many cases they're natural monopolies. Okay, so in many cases you're better off essentially having one supplier. And this is what we're beginning to see in spades. You know, if you think about the Googles, the Facebooks, etc., we're observing an immense amount of concentration of ownership and, and, and of control. And Mary Beth, you made, you made the point, I think, quite rightly, that... You know, ownership in this world is different from uh, the world that preceded it without the sharing economy. But you've still got an owner. Okay? You've, got, you've got an mm -hmm. owner in relation to that intermediary. And so, the, and so the, the, the real question is, how do we build up uh, a system of ownership and governance that creates that trust? In other words, creates a trustworthy institution that's sitting in between. Um, and, that, and that's the thing that we haven't really quite squared yet, and that's an element I think we should be exploring. Okay, well, that, that, in that opening fusillade, there's a terrific array of, <laughs> uh, uh, of, of thoughts, uh, and I'd like to return uh, to the issue of ownership, in particular the issue of ownership of intangibles, really. Yeah. Uh, but first on, on trust, Andrew, uh, in the case of 
Uber, it, it, it has, via a number of kind of negative headlines in recent months, it has lost some of the trust it had. How do you regain that trust? I think, that, I think that's a really good question. I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do now um, is that we've changed the leadership of the business and we are going through a process of changing the culture of the business and, and how we operate. And I certainly wouldn't say we've got everything right over the last um, six or seven years as the, as the company in total or even um, over the last two or three years. And so there's a lot that we can do to make sure that we are more transparent with people. You know, we're clearer with people about what we're doing. Um, and we have a very clear code by which we abide to and act and uh, hold ourselves accountable and ask others, like the people in this room, to hold us accountable to where we don't live up to the high standards that we should be setting ourselves. And, and hopefully we can go about rebuilding some of the trust that, that I think we have lost in the last 18 months. Could I, could I, could I, could I just Colin, yeah. come in at the stage? Because I think the point that Andrew's raising is a really important one as to how, how can an institution that's lost some trust regain it? Uh, and as they say, trust like reputation takes years to build and then seconds to lose. Um, and, and so I think one can look around at what some fairly innovative institutions are doing in this field. And, and, and one of the most important or interesting areas is, the, is artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is essentially not only going to potentially take away jobs, it's also potentially going to take away the decisions we make in our lives. And so, and so that, you know, the, these issues are particularly pronounced in relation to those organizations, and some of them are doing really innovative things. For example, one is uh, setting up a, a governance structure by which they allow experts to come in, roam around the company, look at anything, comment on anything, put anything into the public domain, all right? So one needs to find ways in which institutions not only build up trust, but are perceived to be trustworthy. And, and these sorts of innovative governance mechanisms, I think, are exactly the direction which we need to go. But it's not, can I just bring Mary Beth in here a second and then we'll turn to you immediately afterwards. This, is, this issue of, of Trust. I mean, as, as Colin was saying in one of his uh, in his first in intervention, uh, this is actually broader than the sharing economy. This is an issue that is now yes. permeating the whole of mm -hmm. tech world. Yep. If you'd been doing your job five years ago, I suspect it would have been much easier for you. But now the whole public debate and political debate has turned against big tech and small tech. How much of a problem is this loss of trust? I think it's real. Um, there's really interesting study in HBR, I think it was in the summer, and they showed that of the fastest growth tech companies, um, they tend to fail because of soft stuff like this, trust. They're scaling so quickly, they don't mm -hmm. think about how to put in the processes and the governance needed to make sure that they're actually walking the walk, not just talking the talk, whereas big uh, traditional organizations that have all of that governance and process, and maybe some might argue too much, but w they fail because they don't look outside enough. So the, hmm. the, the entrepreneurial ventures are all constantly looking outside and innovating, but in doing so, they're not building up that, those basic foundations of how to think of it like this. If you have a family and you decide you're gonna you know, have adopt 20 kids at once instead of, <laughs> instead of one at a time over 20 years, your chances of failure are much higher, whereas the companies that have grown a little bit slower and more steadily and have gener often generations of, of back, they know how to behave. So this behavior issue is absolutely real. I don't think it's intentional. You know, th these guys are absolutely shocked when they hear, oh, I did that, oh, I can't, I can't drink like that. I can't do that to women. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are stunned. They just didn't think about it. Um, so I, I, there's, there's something about the, this, the, this pace of change which has to have some governance around it. But the issue of trust in, in tech, I want to bring you in here, mm -hmm. Richard, is, is goes beyond behavior. It, it is also, I think, as, as Colin mentioned, it's this issue of, of this fundamental issue of privacy and, and, oh, absolutely, and, and yeah. data. Absolutely, and I think one of the things we've been really keen to do at Sharing Economy UK is help advance the sharing economy by building trust. And so we worked, in fact, with, with Side Business School with Colin and, and colleagues there to, to develop a set of principles 
um, which we would expect to see in companies who are operating in this space. And they include things around making sure you're validating identities properly, hygiene level things about you know, data protection and, uh, and secure payments, um, but then the slightly higher level elements of, uh, of ensuring that you've got appropriate communication between parties so everyone knows what to expect. Because this is a different type of relationship which people are entering mm -hmm. into. It's not you know, individual with company, it's individuals with each other quite a lot of the time, and the platform is, as well as building its own reputation, prov providing an opportunity for individuals to build their reputations. And so you, know, you have to make sure that those, those processes are appropriate for that, for that particular task. Can we turn to the issue of monopolies? Um, uh, Uber started as a small little insurgent and is now this sort of mighty behemoth how does one, I mean, maybe you shouldn't start on, on this one. Maybe Mary Beth, you come in, come, come, come in on this. Something's gone wrong, hasn't it? Not necessarily with just Uber. All these, all these once hailed, fated tech companies, then they're so successful that they then just... I'd just, I just jump in and say that we are very, very, very far from a monopoly. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I cannot think of a more well-funded, more competitive sector around the world than, 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 no, than ride-sharing. If you think of... Lyft, Ola, Diddy, and all these different companies, there probably isn't a, a single sector that's raised quite as much money over the past three years as investing. And there is, in America, in, in lots of parts of the world, there is no sign that there is, um, is, a, is a key advantage that gets you, to, gets you to monopoly. That said, I mean, network, network effects should be recognized and are an advantage um, when you hit scale. But we, what we haven't seen in, in lots of places is, is a real evidence that scale becomes monopoly, I think. But you're worried about monopolization then? Oh yeah, I mean certainly if, 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 if you look at the, the information world, it's, it's very dominant uh, in, in, in the information world. Uh, and incredibly difficult to deal with in conventional terms. You know, if you think about what one tries to do in, in normal regulation, impose price caps or whatever, uh, if you've got intangible assets, you've got virtually no way of measuring what those intangible assets are worth. So we simply, cannot apply uh, a lot of the traditional principles. Plus the fact that in many cases, these are not national monopolies, they're global monopolies. Okay? Mm. So, you know, that, that, that's one of the great features of mm. electronic access, that it is not tied by national boundaries. But also, then it creates this potential phenomenal feature of monopoly exploitation. And we don't have the international cooperation amongst regulators, competition authorities, et cetera, to be able to handle that sort of uh, international operation. So, so we're not well placed to deal with it. And I'd just like to say that I think this is really critical. There's a real risk that at the end of the day, this causes so much uh, public and political consternation that we end up moving in the direction of saying, well, these are natural monopolies, they should be publicly owned, okay? And you know, that is, as we know, in this country, by no means off the agenda and may well be much more on the agenda going forward. And the monopoly word is now just starting to be added in, in, in Washington as well. Mm -hmm. Mary, Mary Beth, you uh, now have, in your newish role, you have considerable contact with government. In the David Cameron, George Osborne era, there was broadly a belief in the brilliance of, of mm -hmm. the tech sector and so on, and this was transforming society. Gross generalization, but big change under under, ter yes. under Theresa yes. May. Uh, what's your sense of where the regulation debate is going here, and what do you think should be done? Big question. Yeah, that is a big question. I don't know if I'm the perfect person to answer that. But um, I'll tell you a little bit about what our experience has been with uh, their understanding of, of the tech and, and startup culture, which, which has been um, initially... Uh, there was some education to do with this new administration because they weren't as um, uh, 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 familiar with the whole startup and scale up community. Um, but they were very, very open to listening. We had a series of roundtables with various government, top government ministers. And, um, and that opened the door to them really understanding the value of these being some of the most productive companies and the, the engine, the growth engine for mm -hmm. our future. Um, Hence why there is a lot of focus in the industrial strategy on digital, on uh, key sectors like AI, cyber. And uh, I think that they are very open to figuring out ways to make, continue the momentum of, of keeping us as one of the top 
uh, world leaders in digital. Um, because we came from nowhere. I mean, really, London wasn't on the map in 2011. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then in three years, we were the third biggest hub in the world. We can't lose that. Uh, we can't afford to lose that. So um, I think that they certainly got that message. And, and our focus now is the, as a new entity, uh, well, it's the same entity, rebranded Tech Nation, but is to expand that to the 10 other key uh, tech hubs around the country. So it's not just London and a few smaller ones. It's actually trying to build a whole network of strength across the country, and that's the challenge. With your, with your private sector hat on, yeah. uh, do, you, do you accept that as your company grows that actually now is the time where the government needs to be a little bit involved in this sector? So I think that you know, monopolies in general attract government interest for good reason. Um, I think you know, the sector that I'm in, if there's peer-to-peer -peer car sharing with an easy car, it's not one which is demonstrating any, any type of monopoly behavior at the moment um, and has still got so much further to grow that I think it'll be a long time before, um, before it's considered an area where there is, in fact, a monopoly supplier. But I think as we look you know, 15 or 20 years ahead, in the transport sector in particular, you know, when you've got the introduction of, of autonomous vehicles, um, much more sharing of mm. vehicles, which are then don't need to stop and park by the side of the road forever, um, you will, I think, drive towards monopolies, which you know, maybe... Maybe it's Easy Car and Uber that are fighting it out, or there might be some other players who are, who are in there. Um, but it, I, th I think it's when you're selling transport as a service, we're more likely to come across those, those types of problems. Autonomous vehicles, I've got to bring you in here, Andrew. So the only time I visited your uh, headquarters in San Francisco was earlier this year, and I, was, I, I met the head of your flying car unit. Right. Uh, <laughs> the terrific, terrific guy who was sort of painting this sort of exciting uh, vision of the, of the future. But, but I guess what, what strikes me is that uh, increasingly, in a world of autonomous cars and even flying cars, that is, that is a completely transformed Uber, because you go from being an asset light company, in fact, mm -hmm. almost asset non-existent company, to being an asset heavy company. Really? Quite possibly, yeah. And you, you might have seen the recent deal that we've, we, we signed with Volvo to, to buy a significant number of their vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles, in, at some point in the future. Um, I think what I'd say about autonomous is that it's not clear what exactly the business model will look like. And so mm -hmm. um, there are absolutely a few different things that could work. And one of them is platforms owning the cars. One of them is individuals owning the cars and, and using their own car to rent out to peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing platforms at some point. Another one is publicly owned assets and things like that. I think one of the things that's clear to us is that this is going to be an evolving picture over a significant amount of time. We're not going to have a point where you can click your fingers and suddenly autonomous cars are everywhere in every city around the world. And we are very, very clear that at any point, certainly in the next 20 years, um, even, even when uh, autonomous technology has been cracked in most parts of the world, even in London and in most places uh, across Europe and the globe, you will still have a significant number of, of real drivers driving people around still. And um, autonomous is the, is the top up and where you get some significant growth and comes with a lot of extra benefits in terms of getting more people in the same car, removing the need for parking and things like that can, that can really make cities less congested, more livable and greener. Um, but it's very unclear exactly what the business models of all of, um, of Waymo, of Uber and, uh, and Lyft and all of these different um, corporations are going to look like in, in 25 years' time. Mm. Colin, back to, back to regulation a sec. Um, I mean, obviously, the issue of potential regulation uh, of the sharing economy is, is, is broader than... than just the issue of, of potential monopolies. Let's imagine, imagine, imagine for, for, for the afternoon that, that you've been, that Theresa May has come to you and said, Colin, you can redesign the regulation. You have total powers over the sharing economy. I want you to come up with a, with a, with a blueprint for what needs to be done to make sure in our age of inequality and so on and so on that, that the regulation is right. What, what, would you, what would you propose? Well, the answer, and I'm sorry that Theresa May has only given me an afternoon to do this, <laughs> but, 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 but the answer is very much in line with um, what is true of regulation in general. And that is, you don't want to impose onerous regulation unless there's a real market failure. Mm. Okay? So, so, so the starting point has to be, to what extent can one promote uh, appropriate conduct within the corporate sector itself, so that it essentially self-regulates itself in terms of its ownership and its governance structures. And then you focus on those areas where there are real uh, 
social failures that might take place. And, 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 and let me illustrate it with another part of the sharing economy, and that is uh, fintech and the emergence of mm -hmm. uh, you know, platform methods of sharing money. Um, and in that area, there is, as you know, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending, there, there's very little in the way of regulation of that sector, because it basically falls outside of traditional banking regulation. Um, and, that, and that's giving rise to a, an explosive growth of this type of activity, which is all to the good. Um, but one has to raise the question as to, well, isn't it subject to similar types of systemic failures, or is it potentially subject to similar types of systemic failures to traditional banking? And if, if you pose regulatory questions in that way, you focus regulation on where it's needed. Instead of saying, oh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending is potentially a dangerous thing, we need to regulate it, you say, where is specifically the systemic failure that needs to have government regulation as against various other forms? For example, what you were talking about in terms of certification as means of providing the element of trust uh, to both sides of the market. So, you know, I, I would tell her, be very cautious about just leaping to regulation as the solution to all of these problems. It is needed, it needs to be tough, but where it is focused. Andrew, maddeningly for me last night, I, I did a little experiment before this thing, and it didn't go quite as I planned, so I, I thought I'd take an Uber, and I'd chat to the Uber driver and, and, uh, and get some good material. So I chatted to the Uber driver, and the Uber driver, of course, was incredibly happy, uh, which wasn't entirely what I was hoping for, for my question. But none, nonetheless, in, in terms of regulation and government intervention, one of the big questions of our time, as, as you know, is this whole thing of... Uh, of, of inequality and the sort of the left behind and so on. And there's this sort of big debate that's going on and there's been this uh, uh, case going through the courts on the status of your workforce. Uh, and you will probably all be, be aware of this, whether you're treated as a salaried worker or as a self-employed worker. And I mean, if this goes ultimately goes against you, then that transforms your business model, doesn't it? What is the business model of, of Uber if, if all your workforce are decreed to be salaried? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's one we think about an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say on the, on the wider point around the case is that, um, is that one, of the, one of the least innovative things about Uber is, is, the way our, is our approach to the labour market and to self-employment versus salaried employees. Um, private hire and taxi drivers is the second largest sector of self-employed people in the UK. There are nearly 400,000 of them. Uh, and in the UK, around 50 to 60,000 of those work, for, uh, work with or work for Uber, depending on how you think about it. Uh, and um, that's been the case for over 100 years in the case of taxi drivers. It's not something that we looked at and decided to change. It's not something that we felt was, was unique about our business model. In fact, the unique thing about our business model is that unlike a traditional minicab company or a local taxi company, we don't set shifts. There is no mandatory requirement to work. There is no set wages. There is no uniform. There is real genuine control in the individual who chooses or not, or whether, whether to or not to drive, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, compared to a traditional minicab company. And that's one of the things that um, uh, we are very, very keen to preserve, and that's why we are pursuing this case through the courts. If we end up losing, and actually the case is going to end up being a bit longer now than we, than we thought, than we thought it might be, we, yeah. um, one of the things that we always say to government and, things, uh, and people like that is we, we would like legal clarity on this situation, and we'd like legal clarity for the entire sector and the entire gig economy in this sort of way, and that's why we pursued a, an accelerated track towards getting a, getting a final result from the Supreme Court. That's not going to happen. But ironically, I think one of the things that would happen if... Um, we were forced to change a driver's, um, uh, a driver, uh, whether a driver was a salaried, salaried employee or a worker or uh, a self-employed person, is actually we would end up exerting a far greater level of control over that person. Um, and so rather than giving people the ability to log in and log out exactly when they want, um, having no set shifts, the ability to work where they want and uh, in wh whichever car that they want, um, one of the things that we would do is we'd be far, we'd, we'd, we'd mandate people working only at certain times over, the cer over certain periods throughout certain cities, driving in certain cars and, and wearing certain things. So and you cease to be Uber then? You would you? cease, but, you would end, you would end up Why would you do that? I mean, if you already know that the model works and people like it, 
you could still say you're all employed by us, but if it works today, just choose your own work time. Why not? Just keep it. It would be around things like uh, acceptance rates is a good example. So uh, a lot of the debate comes back to what really is work. And so one of the things at issue in the, in the current court case is an individual has said that um, he worked for 70 hours one, one week and only earned, I think, five or six, six pounds. Um, that individual actually only accepted 18% of the bookings or the jobs that were offered to him over the course of the week. And the normal acceptance rate is something like 70 to 80%. And so is that individual who is just logged on to the app actually, mm -hmm. actually working when they're doing things? Or are they keeping an eye on the app, checking whether it's surge pricing, or frankly forgotten to turn it off and things like that? And so one of the things we would have to do is say, OK, you'd only be able to do it between these hours, and you'd only be able to, you'd have to accept you know, over and above a certain number of trips and things like that. Um, and then that's broadly, so we'd end up exerting more control than we do than we do now, which is something that you couldn't just say, "I'm going to fire you if you don't do a minimum." Well, we could do, but uh, <laughs> but but effecti effectively, what we do is probably set the parameters up front yeah. rather than just get rid of people okay. when they were on the app. But um, <laughs> uh, but. Um, the thing when, when we ask our drivers what they like about Uber, um, and we do poll our drivers a lot, and I think it was in the most recent one that we did in September, I think it was just under 90% said that the thing they like most is the ability to set their own hours and work and, and, and feel they feel that Uber fits around them rather than them fitting around Uber. And, and of course, the government asked Matthew Taylor to have a look at this mm -hmm. market in particular uh, and came up with a bunch of recommendations. But I mean, I, I think the research that he did, or that the RSA did, and the research that the CIPD have done as well show that people really value the flexibility. Like you, I've also been asking Uber drivers recently, and they all tell me it's great that they can spend an extra 10 minutes with their kids in the evening before they go out if they want to. So clearly, uh, you know, there is, there's a value to that flexibility. But if we can take on board some of the recommendations of, of Matthew Taylor's work and sort of move towards people accruing some of the rights associated with, um, with employment rather than being self-employed, and we can work out ways that they can you know, get training and things which currently is very difficult uh, to give people training and not then count them as an employee. So if we can do things which make work better in general, then I think we'll move towards you know, a, a, a sort of more acceptable way of interacting with these platforms for, for the majority. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I just, I'm just gone rabbiting on, but I, I, I'd, I'd echo that point. Um, I really echo that point. Oh, we don't like echoing. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> one of the things that we are trying to do is, is figure out where the gaps in self-employment lie and what we mm -hmm. can do to, 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 to help fill them. So training is a good one. Uh, and so we announced last year that every single uh, Uber driver could work with a com company called Future Learn, and we would pay for them to receive online training courses and everything from coding to Japanese literature. Um, the other thing that drivers told us that exercised them most was the idea of sick pay. Uh, they felt vulnerable and, uh, uh, and they felt that they didn't have control over uh, if they were to get ill for a few weeks. So we've worked with the uh, IPSI, the Self-Employed Association in the UK, to deliver an insurance fund. So when drivers have to go on jury service, they, uh, they're sick, um, or they, um, they even, even if they, um, they have an accident while working on the platform, they can access a, you know, some life insurance, some okay. sick pay to tie them over and some jury service. So innovations like that, um, I think, is, is a really fertile way of helping the sector move forward. Right, but it's interesting you call it innovations, whereas for the corporate world, that would be, be just standard. normal. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's Uber, yeah. Uber growing up. <laughs> but, but, Colin. But, but, but I think one has to bear in mind that you know, we're, we're talking about how things are at present or how they're going to be. I mean, what's going to happen over the next 20 years is much more dramatic than any of that. It's not just that we're going to have cars that are going to drive themselves around. We're going to have people who are going to be told what to do by a machine uh, that is going to be making decisions for us. I mean, uh, the one case that always strikes me very forcefully is the uh, observation that in about 10, 20 years' time, we may, might have court decisions being taken by machines that are clearly, in a world of common law, where everything is based on precedent, able to process information mm. far more effectively than judges are. So we really have to think about how do these issues in terms of what is fair, what is reasonable for the different parties involved in the sharing economy, how are they going to apply when in fact we're having these things being done by a, a, an algorithm? Um, and who is going to determine within that sort of algorithmic structure what are, what are reasonable and fair conditions for that to operate? And that's where you know, these issues about, is this going to be set essentially by a public institution? Is it only going to be a public institution that we're going to trust to do that? Or can we find mechanisms by which a private uh, organization can generate these algorithms that are going to have such a long-term and dramatic impact on the way in which our lives mm. are going to evolve. I'd like to just broaden this uh, yet 
wider now, uh, and we'll shortly come to the audience for, for questions. Uh, so we've been, we've been discussing the effect of the sharing economy in particular on, on individual workers and so on, but there's, uh, there's a big issue here for governments as well. Mm. As the economy becomes more and more disembodied, mm. uh, that has major implications for tax revenue. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mary Beth, what, 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 I mean, you're not, I know you're not, you're not running the, 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 the treasury, <laughs> but um, if, you look at, if you look ahead at a scenario, you know, if, if society keeps moving the direction it's going in now, this is going to be a serious problem for governments. Yeah, it, it takes, for these star scale-ups, really they're only, they don't have any fixed assets. Their assets are their computer and their brains. Mm. So they can just pick up and go whenever they want. So it's really, really easy, you know, with Brexit, with indecision, for them to say, oh, uh, maybe I'll go try, try living in Paris for a year. Mm. Maybe I'll try living in Berlin for a year. And actually, the US now, with the, the tax reform, um, <laughs> <laughs> but 20% corporate tax, yeah. uh, that's pretty attractive if you're looking to grow. So uh, we I think do. We're at 18, aren't we now? Yeah. <laughs> in the UK? Come on. <laughs> Competing away <laughs> <way> down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But we, we do have, I mean, I think that's, that is a real issue. And you said there is no, there, there is no international organization that helps. And, and every digital company is global from birth. Mm. So I think there has to be something that looks across the board. You know, we have the UN, we have <laughs> other organizations, but we don't have anybody it's looking. It's definitely at an area that needs, deba that needs debate, because nearly 50% of tax revenues in the UK come from income. It's either income mm. tax or national mm -hmm. insurance. It's 45%. So it, if we see a shift away, then it makes sense to discuss whether or not other sorts of taxation in the longer term are more appropriate, whether those are you know, land-based taxes or consumption-based taxes. They may be more appropriate because we've already seen the, the extreme difficulty that the government got into when trying to equalise national insurance mm. rates for... So not even equalise, but bring closer together the rates for, for, for self-employed workers and, and employees. Uh, and so a, a more holistic approach is clearly going to be required with a, with a roadmap to, from, for getting from here to there over the course of the next decade or two. Colin, can you see your way through this? Well, yes. I mean, I think, the, I, I, I think tax illustrates the issue particularly starkly in so far as the current way in which we're structuring our economies is that it's in the interest of every company to minimise their tax uh, payments, not only in their interests, the directors have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders mm. to minimise their tax payments. And, 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 and that's a very curious way mm. to have structured our companies. And in particular, in relation to the sharing economy, it does bring up some key issues as to whether or not this ownership model is the right one for companies. Because the problem of trust, as I described it, isn't so much between the uh, provider, the the driver and the passenger. It's with the rest of society. And so long as we have these very dominant companies that are essentially focused purely on financial returns, we are going to have conflicts with the rest of society, of which tax is only one illustration. And so, for example, there are some really interesting innovative ideas that are coming through in terms of benefit companies by which companies have not only an obligation to their shareholders, but have a public purpose mm -hmm. that they need to fulfill as well. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it in relation to the Googles and the LinkedIns and possibly the Ubers, et cetera, that's quite an attractive model. It's one that says, yes, the company is there to make money, but it's also got a public obligation and duty and a clearly specified one, which is seeking to fulfill. And then instead of thinking of regulation as the only solution to this problem, one thinks about these ownership and governance structures that provide much more attractive alternatives uh, to the traditional model that we've currently got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andrew, on, 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 on tax, uh, I think I'm right in saying that Uber doesn't pay VAT in, 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 in the UK. What, what would make that change, do you think? Um, it, it depends on the, it, it's all about the thresholds. Yeah. So, so it's at the individual thresholds and where that be set. And actually we saw in the budget, you know, there is a consultation, I believe, at the moment, looking at where the, an individual's driver's threshold should be set for, for VAT, and that, would, and that would certainly change that and things like that. I mean, uh, on tax, I think, as a, as a, as a global company, we, the, our general perception is that we'd like a global solution. We'd like a, a joined up um, conversation where we would have a very clear global action on something that would mean that we could, we could move for, forward with certainty and, and, and deliver what we're, what we're supposed to. 
Having said that, we don't make any money either. So we also, <laughs> also make it, our, our, our tax contribution at the moment would be, be comparatively small. <laughs> I think we should throw it open to the floor here. Uh, would you raise a hand uh, quite clearly if you've got a question? If you don't have any questions, we'll very happily go on talking because this is an endlessly <laughs> fruitful subject. So do I, are, there, are, there, are there any questions out there? So no questions about the sharing. Of, yes, there's one here in the front here. There's a microphone coming on your left. Um, I just wanted to point out the situation in, in the UK that if, you, if Uber win their case at the Supreme Court, if they go on to the Supreme Court, <coughs> then the individuals will be uh, workers, which isn't the same classification as an employee. And in fact, they will be paying tax as a self-employed person, not as salaried, um, which is a sort of considerable problem for the, for the government and also a loss of the revenue. And I was just wondering what the panel thinks um, about that situation and whether they've got any sort of um, ideas on, on tax policy um, and whether these individuals should be paying tax or whether there should be a, a sort of third rate for the worker category. Well, we'll spare you that one, Andrew, in a sense, because I think we, <laughs> think we know what you would, you would say. Who wants to, does anyone want to take that on? It's, it's a very thorny issue, and I think it was uh, summed up by the, the head of the Office for Tax Simplification, who, when looking at this, said, if we manage to sort this problem out, we're going to go straight on to world peace, because we'll clearly be on a roll <laughs> at that point. Um, and I, the, I, the, the difficulty that we saw when Philip Hammond tried to raise the national insurance rate, I think, is an indication of the types of debates that will happen if you take individual pieces on a piecemeal basis. So I think there needs to be a lot of consultation with platforms and re representatives of people who are working in various different ways with them um, to see how we can move towards a situation where everyone feels they are, you know, there is, there is some gain from, from, from either equalization or, or a, change in, a change in statuses. Um, but I would go back to the point I made earlier on as well, that with the situation that we have now, it, is, it may be that we're collecting suboptimal amounts of national insurance, but at the same time, we have very high participation rates in the workforce and lots of people who are within the tax framework. And if you move to systems where people might be paying substantially more for certain types of, certain types of engagement with platforms, you might find that they just migrate off altogether into the hidden economy and then you don't, you, you'll, you'll collect even less. So I, I, as with regulation, a sort of straightforward, simple approach, I think is not gonna get us to the situation which I think we would probably all like to see in the long run, where there's some equal treatment of, of labor taxation um, within the market. I think from where we are to where we want to be is not a straightforward road and requires com consultation between government and business and other, other users of those platforms. Dorian, do you want to come in here? Yes, I think, I think we're being amazingly unimaginative in the way in which we, uh, we try and structure our tax system. And so far as the, one of the tremendous features of uh, the sharing economy and all of the innovations that we're talking about is that they're electronic. And we're, we're, we're collect, well, the companies are collecting huge amounts of information about us. And so it's perfectly feasible for governments to collect much more specific information about uh, individuals involved in those companies and what, and, and, and what the company is, is generating. So in, in terms of this issue about uh, self-employed or employed, well, the answer is it falls somewhere in between. And we need to think about you know, how do we essentially structure a tax system which utilizes the huge amount of information that one can have about the particular way on which, in which individuals are working to structure a tax system that doesn't just say it's a zero one, you're either employed or you're self-employed. In general, you know, all of these people are somewhere in between. And we know what they are, or at least we have the potential for measuring that. But we're not thinking imaginatively about how to structure the tax system. Yeah. Or about collecting it. Uh, and so in, a, in Estonia, for example, we have um, uh, a link within the app that allows Uber drivers to pay their tax at the click mm. of a button, mm. calculates how much they owe depending on the hours that they worked yeah, and how exactly. much they've earned. Exactly. And they click a button, which is obviously hugely positive for a self-employed yeah. individual who wastes a lot of time currently filling in self-certification forms yeah. and things like that with HMRC, and also has yeah. massively increased the tax base for, um, yeah. for the sector in Estonia. And that's just because Estonia has a, a, a really slick tax code. Yeah. 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 Well, and they have the ID. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The EID. Can I ask you, uh, I'm happy to ask anyone the question, but do you think that Uber, Deliveroo, others would be 
in the public eye for this as much if it didn't try to seek the public uh, eye in the first place. So I, I asked because I used to, in my early days, I was with Right Move. I was the product director. We moved from 35% market share to 85% market share. That's most people would define that as, as kind of a real monopoly. Um, nobody said a word. Nobody piped up. Nobody was claiming because Right Move really stayed under the radar. They didn't seek press. They really sought to work directly with the estate agents. So they did not shout and scream. But Silicon Valley shouts and screams. And, and, and part of the VC culture we built up shouts and screams. And you have to promote yourself to get the next round. But in doing so, you call attention to yourself, and you also tend not to think. I've seen where the, you know, they're not thinking about the impact within their own staff and the employees. So I'd just be But isn't, 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 isn't it partly, though, because, uh, uh, yes, Uber is, is, is more in people's faces because people use Uber, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also is that, that word, the precariat, isn't it? That, that right move doesn't employ that many people, presumably. No, it's 250 I mean, 250 employs hardly people. anyone. Whereas I mean, Uber, in, Uber, Uber has word. large numbers of... Yes. of, of of, of, of drivers, and so it affects many more people. Uh, I understand it was the other buzzword. It was around disruption, which, is the, I, think, which I think is the, is the real reason that, pe that, that these mm -hmm. companies are so high profile. I, I, I think that any argument about, slightly academic discussion, but any argument about a precariat is a second order thing that Uber became a very big deal because it was changing something mm -hmm. that had been part of the furniture and um, has a very vocal interest groups who want to want to defend their, their slice of the pie and things like that. And, and if we're talking about people who, are, who have self-employed status, very few of those are actually working on gig platforms at the moment. Obviously, we all expect it to expand over the course of the coming years, but at the moment, in the UK, it's more about construction and you know, delivery and, and retail sectors, which, mm. are, which are employing people on either a self-employed contractors or, or on zero. But, but the interest of, of, the, of, of, of governments now is, is, is more broadly to do with the interest of people, isn't it? And but, uh, on, only when you get in a mature market. So if you, if you look globally, um, most of Uber's issues around regulation are transport regulation issues and about the, the ability for Uber to operate mm -hmm. in a city. Um, and then... Very interestingly, yes, we are a very small part of the taxi and private hire industry across the UK, but we are by far the most high profile. Mm. Uh, any more hands out there? No more questions on anything to do with the sharing economy? All right, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll stay here. <laughs> Colin. Uh, there's one. Oh, there is one, sorry. No? No, he's... <laughs> Andrew's breathing a sigh of relief here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Joseph Puccini. I'm in a private equity fund um, based out of London. Uh, but my question is to the impact on consumerism in the future. So we talk about Uber. I had an interesting conversation with my son, who's 16, and you can tell by my accent, I'm American, so he has the ability to get his driver's license and has no interest in doing okay. so. Okay. And when I asked him, he said, why do I need one? I have Uber. How does that change in car ownership, house ownership, what are your thoughts on, on that for the panel? And consumerism behavioral changes, where you don't need to own a car anymore, what does that do? Well, I can speak first to the car thing, because I also have two teenage sons. They're not American, as you may tell from my accent. Uh, and neither of them would dream of spending the money to have driving lessons. They're 17 and 19. Neither of them intends to own a car, so it's very beneficial for our household, because uh, insuring cars for teenagers is unbelievably expensive. So I see this as a very good thing. Um, <laughs> Glad we could help. <laughs> uh, who wants to come in on the, cons uh, the consumer? Well, I'll, 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 I'll give you an illustration of how it's changed the life of an academic. I mean, you may think it's fairly normal, but I, as an academic, I virtually never go into an, a library now. And uh, because, be, because I can access information electronically and it's essentially shared, uh, it means that owning books, owning journals, etc., uh, has become an almost... And, and, and an irrelevance. And um, is, 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 is this a good thing? I think the answer for the most part is it's a phenomenally good thing. It's provided us with remarkable access to information in a way in which it was inconceivable a few years ago. Will it be a good thing if people don't own cars? And Uber's objective, as I understand it, is basically to eliminate car ownership and to uh, um, make, it, make it essentially common ownership. Um, I think the answer is yes, and if your children aren't going to have to learn to drive a car and they're going to be driven around uh, by a, a driver's vehicle, you know, 
Those seem to me to be all positive advantages. But where one then starts to have a concern is if it's the case that the providers of that remarkable source of information or the, uh, uh, the systems that are going to determine the, uh, the algorithms for driving cars are people that um, have a self-interest as against a communal interest, that, that, then one begins to worry about some of the potential implications of that shift from individuals deciding to pass a driving test to essentially someone de de deriving an algorithm on our behalf uh, that's going to uh, substitute for that. So on balance, I think it's very desirable and very positive, but it's this issue about thinking through the, the long-term social consequences of these developments that I don't think we've done enough of. And, and, and if we think about the great discoveries you know, of the past, like the car, um, we clearly did not think long-term about what, what, what are the potential detriments as well as advantages of these major um, technological changes. Mm. Um, I mean, sorry, Beth. Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, so I, when I moved, uh, obviously the accent, I, I was born in the States, I lived in, the, I've been here 20 years, but, but I spent, I moved to Prague in 1990, right after the Velvet Revolution, I lived there for eight years. And um, for me, that was my awakening to ownership looks different here. <laughs> I remember playing Monopoly the first, when I first arrived with, I taught a Monopoly, the game Monopoly, to a bunch of, uh, uh, English students who were very, you know, sort of university level, they couldn't play it because they kept giving each other, oh, you're out of money, here, I'll give you some more. It's like, you guys, that's not how you play. But what's fascinating is the sharing economy was just intrinsic to actually the old communist society, right? That's how they had to do. They all shared each other's turbans. They all, and, and, and so I think we all have lessons to learn from each other about how to view ownership and um, uh, I, I have five kids, actually, and all of them drive, because they are, except for the one who's too young, but all, all because we kind of forced them to, because we, mm. <laughs> and they don't live, not all of them live in urban centers. I think, I think it's a skill that if you're in a mega city, you're not gonna learn, and if you live in the country or outside of a, a city, mm. you're gonna learn. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have these haves and have-nots again. So uh, that I, I just think it's up to us to decide as parents, you know, how important that is and whether it makes sense or not. But um, I do think that we are living now in a bifurcated world where mega cities will run by different rules than you will outside. And, and I think from from a sharing economy perspective, it's both benefited from the trends that you identify in terms of people learning to drive later in life uh, and has then accelerated that trend as well. But the average age at which people get driving licenses in both the UK and US has been going up for mm. more than a decade. Uh, and similarly, car ownership among that demographic mm. has been falling as well. So I'm pretty sure it'd be, it's actually pretty, Uber's pretty universally used, but for a service like ours, it's very heavily skewed towards a millennial audience who do most of the renting um, of cars most of the time to go, you know, to get out of cities at the weekend is the, is mm. the primary use case. Um, so I think that sort of, you know, that is partially driven by decisions that were made 10 or 15 years ago as much as, uh, as, much as informing those decisions that people are making now. On, on housing, it may be slightly different because I think housing, pushing back housing ownership is much more to do with the cost of housing than it is to do with the fact that you might be able to share someone's house at a later date. <laughs> Any more questions in the floor? Yep, I see one at the right at the back there. Um, my name is Amir Farman Farman from Connection Capital. Listening to MB, um, I was thinking, have we, are we on the verge of sort of achieving the ideals of socialism? <laughs> because, you know, lack of private ownership, common ownership, shared ownership, but in the past that meant state ownership. Mm. Now we've disintermediated the state. It's a question. I, I think there's a spectrum there. Um, the interesting thing about this model that we're in is it's not a co-op is a shared model, right? But then everybody has a share in the ownership. But this is different. That's, this isn't a co-op model. This is just people sharing an asset. And, and 
Much, much to the chagrin of people who started it in the first place. Yes. So like every technology that's ever been invented, I think, there were very great utopian hopes about the sharing economy when it first came about. And you know, the whole con concept of collaborative consumption, it would you know, have massive environmental benefits, which I believe are still there, mm. but those are no longer the primary driver for people getting involved. It's reduced cost or better utilization of assets, which actually gets people working and involved in this. So I, I'm afraid I don't think we're going towards completely shared ownership. It is, you know, we still have individuals or corporations which own those assets at the end of the day. But I think the sort of effective fractional ownership or fractional usage is, is a much more efficient way um, of, of holding those resources. If I could just say, I mean, to my mind, this is not a move in the direction of socialism. Uh, at least it need not necessarily be so. Um, it is very much a matter of uh, how one can combine our capitalist system with innovative ways of uh, managing and holding assets. And provided that we can really identify the ways in which we can do that to a broad benefit of society at large, then we can really, uh, I think, stimulate huge advantages from uh, the development that, that are going on without it uh, necessarily taking the form of socialism. But the point I'm making is that we're not really um, thinking these issues through sufficiently carefully to ensure that at the end of the day we won't all feel the only mechanism by which we can combine these advantages without the manifest failures that are beginning to emerge in lots of different areas and loss of trust is through public ownership. The only way we're going to avoid that is if we essentially innovate in terms of the, the nature of the uh, capitalist system that we've got. And that's why I think that some of these, these ideas that are emerging in terms of things like benefit corporations are going to be actually much more important than anyone uh, understands today. Well, thank you all. Thank you for that last question. I, I, I guess I should say that uh, if Theresa May's government continues to, to, to stumble as it's been stumbling in the last six, six months or so, then come the next election, your, your question may be closer to fruition than, uh, than, than right now, given the opposition. Um, I'd just like us all to thank the panel. It's a terrific conversation. Uh, there's clearly a lot more to be said and debated about this, but thank you all four very much. Thank you.